Well, the most important thing that we do is we end homelessness for our, the neighbors in our community who are still without housing. And we do that a couple of different ways. Um, primarily though, the solution to homelessness is housing. And so either with our rapid rehousing program or with our permanent supportive housing program, we get people into housing and then we provide the support that they need, practical, financial, case management, in order to stay in housing. And since 2006, when we adopted the Housing First model, we've housed over a thousand people in permanent supportive housing, which means we wrap them, we can help them get into housing, we provide practical financial support to stay in housing, but we also wrap them around with support. So case managers help them navigate some of their other life issues to stay in housing. That's for people who might have disabilities, mental illness, um, extreme substance abuse issues, that does not even touch the people that we've moved in, um, moved into housing through rapid rehousing. We have, I don't even know the numbers yet for that, but that's what we do. We end homelessness by getting people into housing. Well, our mission statement actually is working with others to end the cycle of homelessness because for some people, homelessness is a temporary situation. They might have had a job loss, they might have had a death in the family, um, they might have had their hours caught, cut or an illness and they have a temporary crisis and they don't have a support system to step in to hold them up during that crisis and so that's what Homer Ground does. Um, but for other people, they've been living with the trauma of homelessness and probably other severe life crises for a long time and we want to help them make end what's been causing their homelessness, the cycle of homelessness, by providing other options for them in the community. The majority of people are, are homeless in this region because of what I just mentioned. They have a normal life crisis that you or I might experience, but instead of having a mom or a brother or a neighbor to be able to step in and provide help, either financially or um, with an actual place to stay, they don't have those resources. And sometimes it's because their, their support system is impoverished as well, and sometimes it's because they don't have a support system. And that the normal life crisis of losing a job or having an illness throws them over the edge. We have a lot of economically vulnerable people both in this region and in a larger community. It's probably no surprise to anybody here that we have both a lack of affordable housing and not enough jobs that pay a, a decent living wage. And so those things together create a whole um, subpopulation of people who are who are vulnerable at any minute to becoming homeless. Currently, yes. One of the things that we have been really successful with in the region is ending chronic homelessness. But what we found is that right now about 34% of the people in the area who are homeless are veterans. Now we have a major VA center, so people come here to get services and then often don't have a, a living wage. Right. The good news is that we just received a, an SSVF grant from the Veterans Administration um, to end veteran homelessness in the next three years and we are hiring staff right now we're going to be working to target that population. Now we've always ended, we've always served veterans anyway because they come in through our normal process and we serve people who are homeless and veterans are homeless, but right. this is really targeted towards veterans and their families. And so we really think that we're going to reduce that number dramatically over the next three years. And that's partly because we've had leadership on the national level. Um, we've had leadership at the local level that got behind the idea that veteran homelessness is unacceptable. The other population of people that we um, are addressing, and again, we do this all the time, but we're really trying to be intentional about it, is families who are homeless. Um, we actually just had a forum last week on family homelessness and found there's a number of people in our community, um, mostly single moms, but not always, that have those same crises we were talking about, don't have any resources and end up living with their children in a car or living on people's basement floors. Um, they, they, we don't see them so much in shelters because often shelters are not, they either don't have enough family rooms for the families, or if you're a mom and you have a son who's older than 12, the 12 year old son can't be with you in the family room and is expected to go out into the, major, the, main, the main floor with the male population. I'm a mom, I would not want my son to go be separated from me in that situation, so a lot of times they'll live in their car. and. Um, We've seen that number be flat. Instead of reducing the number of families over the last year, it's been pretty much steady. So we're really also trying to attend to that group right now. Because homelessness is a trauma. And when children experience trauma, they have lifelong effects. We want to make that trauma a moment in time instead of a, a long-term experience. Several things. One, be aware of the issue. Learn about it challenge your local officials to get behind solutions to it that work. 
um, is one thing that people can do. Another thing that people can do is honestly donate money and resources to organizations like Homeward Bound because, you know, we we work with a, a mixture of public and private funding, and we're a very lean over organization. About 11% of our total budget goes to administration and fundraising, and the rest of that funding is going straight to keeping people in housing or getting them into housing. Um, people can volunteer time. We have a day center. Um, where we see about 200 people who are homeless every day in our community. That's about 3,700 people last year that we saw individually. Um, and there's always opportunities for volunteer work. And then lastly, um, well, actually, two more things. One is uh, donate items. When we get people into housing, they're often not yet self-sufficient. They might be applying for disability. They might be applying for jobs. They don't have any income, and they frequently just have their backpack worth of stuff and maybe a bin of items that they stored over at AHO. And so people can donate basic household items that get people in, once they're in, people are in housing, it helps stabilize them and it helps turn their empty apartment into a home. And then the last thing I think that anybody can do at any point in time is remember when you see somebody who's homeless, they're a human being that have stories just like you and me. Look them in the eye, smile. Doesn't mean you have to give them anything, doesn't mean you have to do anything. But notice the human being in front of you, because it's a person just like you or me. And honestly, any of us could probably be homeless if we don't have a support system. So I think that's the thing we call So we have one of our programs. So let me just do real very brief overview of our organization. We have two big branches. One is homeless services for people who are not yet in housing, and one is housing services for people who are. In our homeless services division, we have um, our PATH outreach team, and that's a group of trained professionals who go out to find people who are still homeless, who may be camping, who may be um, living under an overpass, who might be living in a car, and to start to develop a relationship with them to get them into our AHOPE day center. And the reason PATH is operational, well, the reason it exists is because a lot of people who are homeless have untreated severe mental illness. Uh, coming into the AHOPE Day Center is overwhelming to them. They may not know how to navigate the systems, and so they, they are being self-sufficient in their camp. So PATH goes out to interact with them and try to bring them in. Um, the next step is our AHOPE Day Center. And I mentioned we see about 200 people a day there. That's where people can connect to basic services like getting a shower, having an address to receive mail at, so if they're applying for a job or benefits, or if their grandma in Kentucky is trying to reach them, they have a place to mail. Um, it's a place where people can make and receive phone calls. It's a place where they can store belongings. It's a place where they connect with other community service providers like All Souls Counseling, like Pisco Legal Services, the VA. But then, most importantly, it's a place to start the process to get into housing. And then the last thing that we have in our homeless services is the Room in the Inn program, which is the only shelter that we offer. It's for 12 women. Um, and it's partnerships with 52 faith communities around the Bunkum region. And essentially, each faith community will host these 12 women for one week in their sanctuary or in their synagogue. We have 12 mattresses so the women have something to sleep on. And I should mention that this is the only program that we have where we really require people to be um, in some state of sobriety. Our model is housing first, and we believe that housing is the support, is the foundation for what people need so that they can work on their mental illness or their substance abuse. But remember the instance we're having people go to other people's buildings and interact with other communities, we, we do ask them to have a, a level of sobriety. And then that, that 12, when those 12 women have a fantastic director that works with them to help get them into housing and then to move out of homelessness. So those are the homeless services that we have. Then on the housing services side, we have our Pathways to Permanent Housing, which is our largest housing program. That's the one I mentioned that we, we provide practical and financial support for, but we also provide case management for our clients. We have about 1,035 people that we've housed with that program. And the last statistics that I looked at show that we have about an 89% retention rate. So that means that of the people we've placed in housing, 89% of them stay in housing. Because if you think about it, if you've been homeless for a while, the skill set you need to survive that experience is really different than the skill set you need to live in an apartment. And so we help them make that transition. So Pathways to Permanent Housing. We also have our um, Women at Risk program. And Women at Risk was originally a program of Western Carolinians for Criminal Justice, a nonprofit that closed its doors about two years ago. And we decided to um, take that program on because it serves women 
who've had a brush with the criminal justice system. And statistics show that if you've had a, some kind of interaction with the criminal justice system, you're much more economically vulnerable to becoming homeless. So we work with women to get to the roots of their criminal justice behavior, uh, not criminal justice, I'm sorry, the illegal behaviors is what I meant to say. We provide counseling, support systems, um, court advocacy, treatment, educational programs, and it's about a four month program and out of the women who graduate that program, within the three year period that we track them, 90% of them never go back and have another experience with the criminal justice system. And we know that that helps them stay in housing, that helps their families stay intact, which means that their children have less interaction with a traumatic experience. So it's part of why we do what we do here. And then lastly, we have these great programs called Wel the Welcome Home Project and the Hope to Home Project. Hope to Home is a, um, is a one year commitment from usually a group of volunteers, often from a faith community, but not always. And they build what's called a team to support a newly housed person for a year. And it's not that they're doing social work, it's helping that person make that adjustment from being homeless to being housed helping them to learn new recreational skills. An example would be that um, I was just talking to our Hope to Home director, and she said that one of her clients, um, their team, the, they ended up finding out that she loved to play board games. She played board games as a child, but had been homeless a long time, hadn't played them, and suddenly had this new kind of resurgence of love of board games. And so they do things like healthy socialization. They might take them to a doctor's appointment. Um, another lady uh, who has a Hope to Home team recently adopted a cat. And which is a therapeutic cat. And they, she brought the cat home. Her team threw a cat party for her. So just things like that to help develop new support systems and to stabilize in housing. And that's a fantastic program. It's intensive and intensive relationship with one client at a time. And the Welcome Home Project is um, what I think I briefly alluded to before, where people who are newly housed get basic household items: dishware, sheets and pillows, cleaning supplies. And we provide that and help move them in so that their house, their empty apartment, feels like a home. Because, you know, again, if you, if you think about it, a house should be a place where we feel comfortable. And if your apartment is um, only a mattress, it's not really a home. <laughs> so that Welcome Home Project really helps people get into housing and then stay in housing as well. As well.